The following episode contains spoilers for the first two episodes of Loki. Me, I presume? Please. If anyone is anyone, then I am you. I have an offer. That's why I found you. Let's hear it. I'm gonna overthrow the algorithm. And cards on the table, I could use a good lieutenant. Yin? I don't know. Look, just show yourself. This cold open ain't getting any colder. Fine. But be warned, the truth isn't always what you expect. Huh. Yeah. So that's the big twist, huh? Yep. Hmm. Okay, uh, should we just hop into the theory then? Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, it was a slip of the tongue. I, I think that would be for the best. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where I encourage you to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so we can magically appear in your sacred timeline of YouTube videos. Speaking of blown up timelines, holy cow does Marvel Studios know how to use their chaos magic to turn Wednesdays on social media into one big Nexus event. The first episode of the new Disney Plus series, Loki, set record numbers. And considering the reveals that happened last night, the social posts aren't slowing down anytime soon. I mean, just as it looked like episode two was settling into a comfy episodic groove, kablooey! Another huge bombshell as it's revealed that the variant Loki our Loki is chasing on behalf of the TVA is a woman. <laughs> Female Loki. Oh, and she also set off a bomb that maybe blew up reality as we know it and may have just recreated the multiverse. And here you thought the gender reveals that started forest fires were bad. Anyway, we've still got four episodes left to go in this thing. Who or what else could we be seeing next? Kid Loki? Lucky Charms Loki? Colonel Sanders Loki? Okay, I made that last one up, but admit it, you wouldn't be surprised. I see you, Colonel Sanders. I see you. White clad, finger licking good Lokis aside, this is a show where literally anything is possible. I mean, the central conceit is all about time travel, alternate timelines, weapons that rewind and fast forward individual people, grenades that can blow up entire realities, multiple characters that can cast illusions, duplicate themselves, and use mind control, even a cosmic bureaucracy seemingly so powerful that they can vaporize demigods and use infinity stones as paperweights. We actually got a lot of those. I mean, not only is everything on the table, but like everything is on the table. That's why it's good I'm not here today to try and predict what's gonna happen in this show. Instead, I'm here to predict what the show is about. Yes, those are two very separate, very distinct things, though admittedly I might also throw in some what's gonna happen stuff in here too. No, what I'm really interested in today is the meta text, the stuff that's happening around the margins of this story, because two episodes in, I'm getting a strong sense of where this is all headed and what the goal of this show really is. And if I'm right, well then, I think I know who the real bad guy of Loki is. It's you. So let's unpack this. Behold! My stuff. What we're doing today is a type of literary criticism called new historicism. Literary criticism is basically a fancy word for interpreting a work of art and supporting your analysis with evidence. Basically a slightly more sophisticated version of writing a five paragraph essay for your English class. And there are lots of different ways to do it. You can look at the historical context around a work. You can look at the author and their beliefs. You can ask whether the author is a socialist or a feminist or has an unconscious oral fixation that's coming out through their work. Or you can just ignore all of that stuff and just read the darn book or watch the darn movie and analyze that. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere near that deep. New historicism criticism looks at the work in its historical context under the belief that, hey, this book or movie isn't just a product of an author, but the product of a moment in history. If you really want to understand what its intention is, you have to also understand the historical context into which it was published. And so that is what we're about to do with Loki to understand why beneath everything else, this is a show about us and our relationship with the current state state of Marvel. So let's start at the very top and work our way down, shall we? Starting with what we explicitly see take place on screen. Loki, the series, follows shock of all shocks Loki. Not the same one that we know from the first 14 years of MCU movies, he's still dead, most likely. Instead, this Loki is the one from Endgame who grabbed the Tesseract and escaped into a portal when the Avengers kind of bungled their time heist, thus creating an alternate timeline. Except, what no one expected was that the new timelines don't get to split off for very long. 
Apparently, there's a way overpowered cosmic police agency called the Time Variance Authority that monitor things like when a stray Loki goes rogue and immediately swoop in to collect them, drag them off to TVA HQ for processing, and set off suspicious looking grenades that appeared to delete incorrect timelines from existing. And yup, if you'd been waiting however long for one of these things to answer whether or not a Marvel Cinematic Multiverse exists, Loki has your answer, no. The TVA makes sure that it can't, but a multiverse used to exist. See, apparently there did used to be a whole mess of different universes, but that was a bad thing because all the different realities kept fighting with each other. Long ago, there was a vast multiversal war. Which you know is gonna be the premise of a movie one day. You know it's coming, and you also know that you want it. I mean, like, I and everyone else watching this scene on premiere night immediately demanded it from our mouse-eared overlords. Anyway, moving on. Supposedly, the multiverse problem was solved by a trio of omnipotent cosmic beings called the Timekeepers, blasting the whole shebang into a single reality called the Sacred Timeline. A single beginning-to-end straight line telling one true version of the story, and the TVA's role is to make sure that the past, present, and future all still happen the way they're supposed to by preventing variants like the escaped Loki from creating Nexus events, which spin off into alternate timelines. Now, why does that word sound so familiar? Nexus. Because the world doesn't revolve around you. But, instead of erasing our variant Loki from existence entirely, TVA Agent Mobius wants to put him to work catching a rogue Loki that's causing all sorts of problems. So, that's what's happening on the surface, but now let's go one layer deeper into the themes of the show. The themes, based on this initial premise, are pretty darn clear. Identity, freedom versus determinism, and the possibility of redemption. I mean, the whole plot is Loki literally on a quest to find Loki. Doesn't get any more explicit than that. And then, not only is he tasked with finding himself, but he also has to learn who he himself is in a sea of himself, and in a world where his decisions are predetermined. As the first episode says, You ridiculous bureaucrats will not dictate how my story ends! It's not your story, Mr. Laufusen, it never was. And again, with Lady Loki. This isn't about you. And that, my friends, is our big question. In a world where everything is predetermined by a sacred timeline, what does it mean to be free? Go figure, the god of mischief is on the side of upsetting the apple cart and not being told what to do, whereas the TVA believes that the sacred timeline has to be upheld no matter what. Which leads to probably the easiest prediction theory that I've ever had to make on the channel, the Time Variance Authority are not the good guys in the story. What? No, that is shocking. Go figure, the regime of time-space middle managers are bad despite them saying that they're good. Who would have thunk it? It's not like there were any signs along the way, like, say, their Minutemen field agents dressed like heavily armored riot cops, their processing centers deliberately evoking the beige, fluorescent-lit dehumanizing mazes of a DMV or a small claims court, and their entire overall aesthetic evoking a mix of mid-century American meets early Soviet bureaucracy. Not too hard to read this writing on the wall. But what's even more concerning is their philosophy, especially in the MCU where individuality, free will, and the idea that we are not bound to our fate are like the core moral components to almost every major hero. Just look at Gamora, Nebula, Bucky Barnes, heck, even the original Loki changed his ways to fight against Hela and Thanos. But that's not how the TVA sees it. Instead, Mobius informs Loki that his evil nature was always the plan in the sacred timeline, right up until it wasn't. That his only real purpose was to be a bad guy for the good guys to become good guys by defeating him. You weren't born to be king, Loki. You were born to cause pain and suffering and death. That's how it is, that's how it was, that's how it will be. All so that others can achieve their best versions of themselves. But here's the kicker, they don't really have an explanation for why things have to be how they are. We're told the multiverse was bad to begin with, but, well, we, we don't actually know if that's true. We're supposed to take them at their word, even though the timekeepers stay out of sight, and apparently only directly communicate with judges. The timeline is sacred, because the timekeepers say it is, period. Just take it on faith. The whole thing sounds an awful lot like a religion, with omnipotent godlike beings communicating their will through a chosen few that you just gotta believe. Heck, in episode 2, when Loki finally asks what the end of the whole big story is, Mobius says that they don't know. They're waiting for the timekeepers to untangle it and fill them in. How does it all end? That's a work in progress. Oh, those lazy timekeepers, what are they waiting for? <laughs> au contraire. No, because while we protect what came before, they're toiling away in their chamber, untangling the epilogue from its oh, infinite branches. I see. So, when they're finished, what happens then? 
so are we. In other words, the TVA doesn't even know what they're fighting, dying, and running cosmic black ops for. Forget religion, that's called a cult. And if they're truly the bad guys, well, remember that judge that sentences Loki? Her name is Ravona Renslayer. In the comics, this name belongs to a princess, consort, and on-again, off-again romantic interest to Kang the Conqueror, one of the most feared and powerful Marvel villains ever. And wouldn't you know it, he just so happens to be a villain from the future obsessed with reordering the timeline line to ensure his victories, using time travel, reality hopping, and illusions to get exactly what he wants. Sounds an awful lot like the timekeeper is supervising the TVA, doesn't it? And I learned from my mistakes watching WandaVision. If it looks like an Agatha Harkness and wears a brooch like an Agatha Harkness, then chances are it's an Agatha Harkness. So big bad time travel guy with a close hench person named Ravona and every episode lingering on that final face in the center of the courtroom? Just saying, there's a chance that all these stories are connected. It also helps that the Actor Jonathan Majors is believed to be playing Kang the Conqueror in the upcoming Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. So we know that there's a high likelihood that this guy's gonna show up in the relatively near future. But now it's time to get into layer three of our analysis. Why we're the villains of this whole thing. The meta-narrative. Think about what role the timekeepers play in the meta-narrative of Loki's story so far. Omnipotent beings who are aware of everything that's ever happened or will ever happen. And who have the ability to send ultra-powerful agents to any place in the universe at any point point in time, but instead of rescuing people from danger or stopping disasters or even trying to make anything better, they're exclusively concerned with making sure that the events on a timeline that they decided was the right version, the sacred version no less, continues to happen in the way that they already know them to have happened. Despite all their titles, these guys aren't keeping time, they're keeping continuity. Those stuffy bureaucrats and jackbooted thugs with batons going around literally beating up variants and blowing up mistakes, that's meant to be us. That Marvel meta-narrative is pointing back at fans who might be getting ready to ruin everyone's fun because the timeline isn't perfect. The Darkhold from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't look exactly like the Darkhold from WandaVision. And in case you think, eh, that seems to be a little on the nose for the moral of the series, remember, Captain Marvel ended with every guy who complained about the concept of Carol Danvers being overpowered gets ragdolled across the desert. Prove to me! You can beat me with that! Meanwhile, it's pretty clear based on how the series is turning out in the upcoming slate of films that Loki is either going to end with fracturing the sacred timeline or is setting the table for that to happen early on in Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. The worst kept secret in Hollywood is that Marvel's next big trick is probably that a cinematic universe is about to become a cinematic multiverse. The Sony Marvel partnership is doing another animated Spider-Verse movie. Pretty much everyone already knows that Spider-Man No Way Home is some kind of multiverse movie as well. There's References to both the MCU and the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies in the trailers of both Venom 2 and Morbius, and they're about to launch an animated anthology series entirely about alternate reality storylines. Whatever they ultimately decide a multiverse means in this context, the Marvel multiverse is coming. Probably pretty soon. It's a good way to manage the expanding roster of properties, it lets you revisit characters you've otherwise retired, you can try out ideas that might not be ready for the mainstream, as well as keep characters who might not play well with everyone else, like Deadpool, Blade, and Punisher safely in their own spaces. You could use it as a hand wave to pull in established characters you've acquired from elsewhere but keep them in their more famous forms, all while fixing inconsistencies. But the thing about a multiverse is, just like Miss Minutes says in episode one, they're messy, they're chaotic, things get jumbled up. So do you kowtow to the timekeepers and limit yourself to a strict deterministic series of events like the TVA, blindly following a path towards some unknown ends, or do you side with Loki and loosen up a bit and allow for a little bit of chaos? Because guess what? Chaos can be kind of fun. Well, if I'm right about this, and I'm feeling good about it so far, then the Loki series is Marvel telling us their decision. A little bit of mess is worth it in the long run because it lets them do more fun stuff. When it comes down to a choice between avoiding a continuity error or doing something awesome, they are going to try to do something awesome. Does time travel mean that suddenly Steve Rogers stayed oddly silent throughout national tragedies like the Vietnam War? How did Doctor Strange get everyone organized for the big final portal? charge. Shouldn't he have intervened at some point throughout the entirety of WandaVision? Mistakes like that are gonna happen, but isn't it worth it just to hear Falcon's voice over Cap's earpiece? On your left. 
So whatever else Loki ends up having to reveal about the future, past, or in between of the MCU, the real statement Lady Loki was making when she bombed the sacred timeline was all about the series' meta-narrative. Not just putting the timekeepers on notice for whatever their canonical agenda is, but telling us to brace ourselves for the messy, the chaotic, but the much more interesting and narratively fulfilling multiverse to come. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Almost, because I'm gonna be derailing the timeline of this episode on behalf of our sponsor, Displate. Displate loves fans and fandoms. They were good enough to hop aboard this episode to support us, and I would love it if you showed them some support in return by clicking the link in the description below. I know a large portion of you watching are proud members of various fandoms throughout the internet. Whether it's Star Wars, the MCU, classic video games, or heck, just cats. A lot of you are artists yourselves, or appreciate art that helps express your fandom. And Displate is like the perfect match for everyone who watches these episodes. That is not an exaggeration. Displate is an art company, they have beautiful prints, but they're not flimsy paper prints or even canvas. These things are metal plate prints. Yes, metal, a material that can actually survive the entirety of your life. Whether you're in a dorm room, your first apartment, or like your sixth house, the prints are gorgeous, incredibly high quality with vivid colors, and best of all, they can be mounted on the wall using special stickers and magnetic plates that come with the artwork. That means no damage to your walls, no having to use drywall screws, no having to awkwardly hang and rebalance things. You literally do not need to own or have ever lifted a hammer. I got a ton of prints from them. They are literally all over my house right now, and I hung them all in less than three minutes. I got inspired by my love of classic Nintendo games and Minecraft. I also got some cats because I was just really into the design of these cats. I mean, look at how incredible these guys are. They have a zillion prints, and among them, wouldn't you know it, are beautiful designs inspired by the man himself, Loki. There are a huge number of posters available to capture one of the coolest characters in the MCU during Displate's special partnership for the show. I'm really loving the retro vibe of some of these, but there's also a huge range of styles and colors to go with your space and your vibe. Check them out, poke around on the site, it's just fun to look at all the different artwork that's available, and I guarantee that you will find something that you fall in love with. On top of that, Displate is a give back company who donates a portion of their proceeds to reforestation programs around the world on an ongoing basis. Not just when it's cool to do so or when they're getting publicity for it. So you get something amazing, you help them make the world a little bit better in the process, you don't need any more convincing, you just need to get in there and become the art collector that you were born to be. That link is down in the description below, I encourage you to check them out because they supported this channel and they deliver an amazing service, and I'll see you all next week.